Welcome back to the Believe in Jets podcast. My name is Rami Lavi. That is BP, former Jets running back Bilal Powell. Dude, we're both developing stress pimples from this freaking team. I know. They were supposed to be three and one. They were supposed to. They were supposed to. It's crazy, dude, because you talk about splitting the season into quarters, and when you look at the three or whatever, the first quarter of the season, right? They should have been three and one based on their schedule, and they should have won that game. And yet, if you think they're a couple of Will Levis boneheaded plays away from being one and three, it's crazy what this team is doing right now. Hey, and listen, and I, and I call three and one, but the way they've been playing has been kind of iffy. It just seems like uh, missing those preseason games. This is an early on uh, team that still needs to be building on chemistry. Uh, I definitely think that. In the middle to the end of this 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 season, this team will be clicking. Uh, I just just stick with them. Uh, hopefully, they can continue to squeeze out some wins during that time. But I, th- I definitely think that this is going to be a team that's going to click later on in the year. So you're not out on them. I know, see, my job in media and as a fan is I overreact to these things because these things drive me crazy, right? You seem more even keeled. You seem to have the athlete's perspective on this. Is that the vibe I'm getting? It, it definitely is because it's a very long season. And you're going to look at teams just like last year. You're going to look at teams that just look like they were just ready to roll that ended up folding from penalties and uh, injuries and just not executing later in the year. And then you're going to look at teams and be like, well, they're struggling. They're out. Um, they're not going to make it. Uh, for example, Kansas City Chiefs last year, the way they played early on in the year, everyone mm-hmm. was like, it's no way they make it back to the Super Bowl. So you just have to have that team, that veteran leadership. Hopefully those conversations between players, those only the players only meetings happen earlier this year than later. Uh, so, you know, I, I do think that with Aaron Rodgers' leadership and uh, his, his, his uh, eagerness to win, I think they'll turn it on later in this year. So in October, the Jets have five games, all right? Mm -hmm. So we could count this as the second quarter of the season, these five games. They have the Vikings in London, Monday night football at home against the Bills, Sunday night football on a short week in Pittsburgh. At New England, which should be a win, New England stinks. And then home Thursday night, they have a quick turnaround. This is the fifth game. Home quick turnaround against the Texans on Thursday night, which we talked about being a tough game earlier in the year. Those are five games. If you go two and three in those five games, you almost feel like that's a win. I think so. And you definitely wanted to see uh, the New York Jets squeeze out that win the other day uh, versus the Broncos to sit at three and one because you just, you that's just, the problem. I look at those games. If they're two and three, then you're talking about four and five to start the season. I four mean, and five. which is still puts you at the middle of the pack. And then you just have to find a way to win those games later in the year. Uh, but you don't want to get to a point where you're constantly uh, dependent on scenarios. Like you want to be mm-hmm. able to say, I'm a, I'm a playoff team. It's not, Oh, if we win that team loses, and you have to depend on so many different scenarios. So you have to win those games that's, that are necessary, like the Broncos game. That one game is something you're going to look back later on and be like, we should have won that football game. Now you're talking about the Vikings, the Bills. you talk about the Texans. Those are some tough teams that you're going to play. Like the Vikings are on a roll right now with former quarterback Sam Donald. So, you know, it's one of those things where they just have to find a way to win. We'll get to the Vikings in a minute, but you talked about the Broncos. That loss, I mean, it's so frustrating because you had the opportunities. It always feels like, and let me ask you about this, because I sit here, and I said it on Mon- on Sunday right after the game. When I recorded right after the game, I said, you could change the players, you could change the uniform, you could same- change the coaches. Sometimes it's the same old Jets, right? And like, When there's a game that you need to win, it's not the game that you're supposed to win, but if it's the game that you absolutely have to win, they find a way to lose. How does that happen? Because you're a guy who came from Louisville. You didn't know the Jets culture. You didn't know the Jets organization. When you came in, they were a winning organization. So how does the same old Jets thing happen? Aaron Rodgers comes from winning in in Green Bay. Garrett Wilson comes from Ohio State and winning, right? Like, how do they come here and all of a sudden become 
losing players? Uh, I, I wouldn't say losing players. I, I definitely wouldn't say that. But I, I will say this. It does seem like there's a curse going on. Uh, we talk about the expectations of Aaron Rodgers last year was on his high. He got hurt. Now you're seeing him lose to the Denver Broncos. And you're still seeing the, the Jets struggle in the run game. You're still seeing the defense making mishaps and miscues and miscommunications. And it's just like one of those things where, like, what needs to be done? Like, you already talked about bringing in the GM. Joe Douglas has been doing a good job. You talk about the head coach. Uh, so we're sitting here as fans and uh, uh, spectators. Like, what is that? What's going on? Because we have this high expectation of what the New York Jets are supposed to look like with Aaron Rodgers behind an offensive line that they rebuilt that looks great on paper. Like, what is really going on? Part of it was the pre-snap penalties. They had five of them. They had only one in the previous three games. And Robert Sala said after the game, maybe we need to dial back the cadence. Now, to me, dialing back the cadence, it's like telling Lamar Jackson he's not allowed to run if you tell Aaron Rodgers he's not allowed to use cadence. So – what exactly – can you explain? Because, again, I, I think there's been so many people talking about it. And since then, R Robert has walked his comments back. Aaron said, we're going to keep doing Cadence. We use it as a weapon. What exactly is Cadence? How is it used? Um, can you just try and explain to some fans? Because a lot of people have been talking about it this week. I don't know how many people have stood at a line of scrimmage and actually understood what that means. You have. So what does happen? I, I will say this, though, just before I get into the cadence of what the cadence is, uh, what a lame excuse from the head coach. If oh you're talking God. about dumbing down a cadence for professionals, guys, you pay to be able to sit um, before pre-snap. We call those self-inflicted wounds, pre-snap penalties. You know what the snap count is on. No matter how, what Aaron Rodgers say or how he say it, you know when the ball is supposed to be snapped. And you're talking about pre-snap. You're at home. It's not like you're away playing in a very hostile environment. So that's a lame excuse for me. Uh, I was always about being complex and, and finding a way to win and just be a professional. Um, when you talk about dumbing something down, you're talking about grade school. You're talking about high school. You're talking about Pop Warner. These are professionals. Um, so the cadence is pretty much an inflection of the voice of the quarterback to say, okay, fellas, here we go. And it's a rhythm. It's a rhythm. You have color number. Uh, different different teams use different numbers, different colors. Uh, some colors are uh, what we call a dummy cadence, which if we call it, that means we're trying to get the, the defense to jump. And then if they show their hand and they don't jump, we can kind of recognize the blitz. We can then get to another color that tells the offense that, hey, we're live this time on this cadence and it's going to get us into a play. So the cadence is used – to uh, it's pretty much used for the offense at an advantage. Like we know the, the the snap count, and the defense has to anticipate the snap count. So it get it slows down those uh, you know dominant defense linemen who are getting up the ball. If we're saying hey he's getting in the backfield, it's a chance for us to go on to maybe we give him a dummy call to try to get him to jump, or uh, now he has to kind of hold back so now we can fly off the ball and take advantage of him going backwards or getting back into his stance. So it's definitely something that offenses utilize as a weapon. So if you can't utilize the snap count at the professional level, then your offensive line are going to get teed off on every single time. And with these defense alignment being more athletic than these offensive alignment, that's something that you would hate to see as, a, as an offensive coordinator, watching an athletic guy get off the ball over your offensive alignment. So uh, I will say this. Aaron Rodgers is right. They should continue to use the, the cadence as an advantage uh, to help the offense. A hundred percent. I mean, it's one of his biggest advantages and I fully agree. And I appreciate you explaining that. And that was like exactly what I wanted to hear. And it's exactly what every Jets fan wanted to hear, right? Because this is what Jet fans have been yelling about. You're someone who's still in the huddle and understands that and has seen Rodgers from the other side. You know, you've seen Aaron Rodgers do this and use that cadence and even with a silent count in San Francisco, he got a team to jump off sides and threw a touchdown on that play, right? Yes. So, like, he, he's, he's the best at it. There's nobody better than him. And so to take that away from him, it would be like, you know, telling him to play with one arm behind his back. Like, it's, it's idiotic, you know what I mean? Um, but what was happening was the first play of the game was a sack. And then you see they were getting jumpy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were clearly just – the offensive line was nervous. 
Brees Hall had two false starts, it, both out of the shotgun. You're a running back. Why would a running back have a false start out of the shotgun? Listen, I, I just think it was just one of those games. It, when, when you talk about just being uh, a team that turns on the film the next day and just say, we just did not execute. We did not do the right things. We did not uh, utilize the opportunity to beat a uh, bad Broncos team, <laughs> I would say at least. Probably did put us in a position to be three on one. We did not utilize those things. We just did not execute. And for him to jump in the backfield, sometimes that comes from being in, just trying to anticipate a blitz or, or trying to recognize something. Or sometimes you just plain not forget. You, you got a lot on your plate. There's pressure. All right. You're going through, you're lining up, you're going through your progression. Who do I block? Um, uh, what, what's my check now? Uh, where do I need to go? What hole do I need to go through? And when all that is processed and you sometimes lose like, oh, snap, I'm going through all of this in my head. But what was the snap count? So now I'm back there anticipating as a running back, like, oh, shoot, what, what was the snap count? I go through all this progress and everything's spending a million miles an hour. And it's raining. Let's be honest. All that plays a part. It's raining. All right. It's drenched. And all these things go. And, and you sometimes forget, man. It's just like we call those just a knucklehead play. Yeah. So um, Tiki Barber was saying it's just a lack of attention to detail, right? Mm -hmm. That you need to be so attentive to every single detail. We saw late in the game, um, and a lot of people were looking at this, a sack on Aaron Rodgers where Brees runs to the middle. And now Denver blitzes more than any other team in the league. You know who blitzes second to most in the league? Brian Flores and the, and the Minnesota Vikings. So the mm -hmm. Jets are going to have to figure it out before Sunday. But they, you saw Brees, and I sent you the clip, the all 22. He runs to the inside, and then the blitz comes from the outside. Rodgers gets sacked. Rodgers never saw it coming. Blindside hit. He looks up, and he looks at Brees like, what are we doing here? He was looking at a lot of guys like, what are we doing here all game? Um, what happened on that play? So what I saw is what a lot of defenses are starting to go to in a, in a fourth and long situation, a third and long situation, is they're trying to take two linebackers, inside linebackers, and they're putting them in the A-gap. And then they're walking down a safety and putting him on the edge, which means that there's probably a possibility that there's man-to-man -man on the outside from the receivers and the corners and the, and the defensive guys left. That is, uh, to me, that's just saying, hey, we're trying to bring more than what you can handle. Or we're trying to disguise the way you are now holding Brees Hall's eyes in the A-gap and we're bringing the guy off the edge. We're dropping the two inside guys uh, in zone, but we're trying to hold Brees Hall's eyes. Uh, the most dangerous man is in the A-gap, not the guy on the edge. The guy that can get uh, faster to the quarterback is the guy in the A-gap. Brees Hall did exactly what he was supposed to do in double A-gap uh, blitz. Take care of the A-gap. But what people don't understand is it's hard to go from an A-gap all the way out to a, a D-gap. So how do we handle that? You handle that with a throw, what you call built-in hot routes. You got to get the ball out fast. And the reason that defenses are doing this is saying, hey, we're going to get to the quarterback before you're able to get to the sticks on fourth and ten. So that was a well-called play by the Denver Broncos. Um, maybe it was something that was uh, like an airhead play from the offensive coordinator, knowing that Denver was a high blitz team, that he didn't have any kind of hot routes built in, or Aaron Rodgers didn't. Uh, you know, mostly if you see pressure, all right, and this is an Aaron Rodgers thing, if he understands there's a double-A guy, double-A gap, and there's a hang guy out on the left, he probably is going to be unblocked. So he has to anticipate these two guys coming in the middle. So Aaron Rodgers should know that, okay, I have a guy hanging to my left. I know that if I get this ball, the double-A gaps are handled. I need to fade away from that pressure to save myself time to get rid of this ball downfield. That is an Aaron Rodgers mistake on his half, being a veteran, understanding that there's a possibility that they're going to bring more than what we can handle. If, Aaron, if, if Brees Hall would have went to the D-gap, out toward that hang player, then there would have been a free guy running up the middle. So that was just a well-called play from the defense and just a, a, a lack of communication between the offense, and it wasn't executed from uh, Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. You know, it's funny you call the offensive coordinator. You said it was an airheaded play. Some might say he's just an airhead. Um, but the point is, 
last year we talked so much about him and then we said well you know a lot of these things will be fixed once Aaron's back it looks like it's still the same slop right and even Garrett Wilson and we'll talk about this in a minute regarding something else but he said he's like I feel like a lot of teams are changing things up constantly and we're doing a lot of vanilla the same stuff over and over again well you know what, Garrett, if you guys are making mistakes on the vanilla stuff, I don't blame the offensive coordinator for not mixing in other stuff on top of it. But what's going on with this play calling, with the coaching? Do you trust the coaching right now? We don't see in-game adjustments from Robert Sala. And then now he's having, again, another situation in the media where he's, you know, saying the wrong thing. Do you trust that Robert Sala is the coach who can get this turned around? Because I don't. Honestly, it's not looking too bright for Robert Sala. It, it, it's not. For his future as a New York Jet head coach, I don't think it's looking promising at all um, as of now. Uh, we'll see later on in the we'll see later on in the year. But I would say this, man, from from a, a former player, um, as a former player, um, it, there needs to be some player accountability as well. Okay. Um, Maybe maybe Aaron Rodgers uh, needs to take the entire offense in and, and, and he maybe he said maybe it by the way he said it on McAfee. Aaron said, um, you know Robert and and Nate. He said they can't go out there and execute for us. He's like only we can execute, so we just have to execute better. Yeah, and listen, I, I always call it a copycat league, a copycat league. So when I'm watching film, Rami on the opponent from another opponent. And I look at their explosive plays, the plays that are successful against the opponent that we're going up against. I'm looking at what they're running. So as Nathaniel Hackett, he needs to understand that he can copycat from the other offensive coordinator. Because if the defensive coordinator from the Minnesota Vikings, all right, who's a high blitz team, see how successful most blitzes were against the New York Jets, he's going to run the same exact stuff. So if he if he opens up film and he sees, well, the New York Jets can't handle double A guy, well, what do you think he's going to see versus the Minnesota Vikings? All right? So it's the same thing. The thing hack it. What is going to make the New York Jets successful against that opponent? All you have to do is look at film. Everyone's running the same thing. It's not like people are inventing things. It's just finding ways to run it differently. Same concepts from different uh, formations. How do you get to different uh, formations? You motion, you shift. Those are the things that the New York Jets need to do. I just would like to see the thing you had to open up the playbook. I, I would like to see him run some some things that almost make me go, "Wow, he's really utilizing the talent on his on his team on his offense." Because on paper, again, once again, I know we keep saying it, he has talent on that team. Mm -hmm. Like he has yep. it. Yeah, and, and that's a huge part of it that you want to see more utilization of things that maybe you know going in hurry up and trying to get to the line quickly so Rodgers could see what's going on quickly would help also and I know he's older and he's a little banged up now um because he got hit 15 times um on Sundays but like I, I still think they need to get to the line so that they can um you know decipher what's going on you know so I, I'm just I, again it's not it's something that I'm just um it's confusing you know, it's I, I'm just trying to figure out what they can do, because usually Aaron Rodgers is a guy you don't want to blitz. Right. That's not a guy you would want to blitz against because he can find he'll find the holes and pick you apart. But it seems like in this game. But but, but you know what? You know what comes with being able to pick guys apart? It all it, everything lies on everyone. That's the O line. That's from pass protection. And that's your that's your skill, guys, your receivers, your tight ends, your running backs. Getting open. They have to yep. get open in order to be able yep. to, for him to pick them apart. So, you know, it, it, it all it all run run backs on it run back on everybody, right? It's, it's the offensive yeah. coordinators, the quarterback doing his job, it's the running back and, and the receivers and the tight ends and the offensive linemen doing their job. Like, because what we see on TV is just a small fraction of what you see uh, from film study. You see a lot more when you do film study. And I guarantee you, when you cut on film, there's not guys just running open, Rami. They have to find yeah. a way to get open. And, and a lot of that has to do with play call. A lot of that has to do with moving guys around, motion shifts, doing something that's creative to uh, complement the talent 
that is on the team, the attributes. Like, there's no reason why we can't put uh, Garrett Wilson in the inside and motion him and get the nickel back off of him and do some stuff where he's running across the field or he's faking across the field and going back out like true man beaters. Because Denver Broncos, if you blitz, you have to have some sort of man coverage behind it a majority of the time. So if I know a team is blitzing well, then I'm ready to get Garrett Wilson involved in some kind of man-to-man beater route to put stress on Patrick Sertain, who was guarding him. Like, it's not just an over route where he can just funnel him to the top of the safety. Like, do some kind of option route for Garrett Wilson to keep him guessing. Yeah, and it just felt like no one was on the same page. And the problem is they didn't make in-game adjustments. And that's one of the biggest issues with this team is they don't make any kind of adjustments. And one of the things we talk about a lot with adjustments is Xavier Gibson. I don't know why he's on the field at the end of the – I don't even know why he's ever on the field back there. You've been talking about this since the since the punt return against Buffalo last year. He hasn't done anything, and he's given this grace because he had a punt return. He seems uncertain back there. He bobbles snaps. Or he bobbles punts, I should say. He takes it out explosive. when he should in. He, he's, he's not he's game not ex- changer. Let's be honest. There's he's nothing not to him. Like, try you, – you know, you uh, – who was the kid, Davis, that they drafted, right? Like, try someone else back there. Yeah, I, I, I just don't think that – and he seems like a good guy. You can tell he's always smiling. And, and, and part of that is, is uh, keeping him around, man. Probably his personality. They really like him uh, just as a teammate. But just on the field, uh, he just doesn't seem like he can just be game changer. Like, I, if I put a guy back there, there's a limited opportunities to that. So if I put a guy back there, I would definitely, definitely want a guy that when he catches the ball, the opposing team is holding their breath. And yeah, Isaiah David Davis. Gibson is doesn't the, get, he doesn't give us that. Back. He doesn't give us that. So, you know, I thought last year McCole Hartman would have given us that, Mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, because he can go at any time. Um, And also he can help us on offense. Like, you have to bring the guys over for what they've done. Like, if if McCole Hartman was a guy that was was, uh, a special teamer over in Kansas City, uh, if he was a gadget guy on the offensive side, why do we bring him over and not utilize him like that? Come on, Nathaniel. Nathaniel Hackett has to utilize guys based on what you evaluate them as a scout. If, if like Malachi Corley, we know that this guy caught 115 balls, five yards or less in college. Let's see him catch some balls and make some guys miss. Let's see that. Let's, let's bring him in. Let's change. Let's switch some gears now. It's time to switch gears because before we know it, this season is going to get away from us. And we, and we have to make sure as an organization, we, they need to make sure that, they're doing everything in their power to be successful. And that means using everybody on the roster if you have to. Maybe that's maybe that's Braylon Allen getting more carries because he's been more efficient when he touches the ball than Brees Hall this year. Yep. Um, one of the things we talked about when the schedule came out was the trip and the travel to London and when deciding to go, when they go. Salah decided, you said you would have rather gone earlier in the week than what you guys ended up doing. Salah said he wanted to do it the same way they did it last time. And this is classic Salah. He wants to do it the same way they did it last time. Well, guess what? Last time didn't work out. They were down 20 to 3 at the half in 2022 against the Falcons. So you're telling me that that's the, what you want to look at? Like, oh, we, we really did it successfully last time. So we're going to do it the same way. Maybe it wasn't successful last time. You slept walk through the first half of the game. We we're down 20 to three to a bad Falcons team. Like it's just some of the stuff that drives me insane. Like he's just doing it because that's how they did it. And you don't look at it and make an adjustment. That seems so simple. They're not going till Thursday afternoon. Um, what would you have wanted to see? And do you think the results are going to be the same in London? Listen, I don't think I've turned on a game in London and any game has been close. There's always one. It's always lump sided. And it's always like one team just destroying the next team. I mean, just watching the highlights. Uh, the way the Minnesota Vikings are playing, I think this game could get ugly if the New York Jets do not travel with a focus. Um, some guys travel uh, thinking it's vacation, and some guys travel knowing it's business. And the team that travels in this game, knowing that it is business, is going to put up a lot of points. And the team that is trying to utilize this as a vacation – they're going to go over there and get destroyed. So I hope that the New York Jets are on the side of understanding that this is business. And this is a very important win versus a very good football team. And a quarterback that if you put enough pressure on him, I think he'll throw us a couple 
I think he'll throw us a couple. All right. And I think it's going to set us up for the Buffalo Bills and the New England Patriots. Like, as crazy as it always sounds, Rami, we're still in that spot of this may be the game that we bounce back from. We win a close game. We go on, play Buffalo, and we be 2 0 in the division. I'm, I'm just calling it now. Maybe. Let's hope. I hope so. I hope so. It's so funny. I was just trying to look up Vikings traveling to England, and it's giving me a history lesson on the actual Vikings traveling to actual <laughs> England from years ago. But yes, I just found it on on uh, NBC. It looks like the Vikings also are traveling late Thursday night and arriving early Friday morning. So they should be on the same schedule as the Jets. That was kind of funny. And, they're going to be, and their travel is farther than the Jets. Yeah, they have to yeah. go. You're right. It is a little further. Aaron talked about that also when he went from Green Bay a couple of years ago. He had to go a little further from Wisconsin, obviously. And I don't even think they have international flights from there. Uh, I guess maybe that – I don't know how that works. Do they yeah. – I don't think they have a big enough runway. I'm. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't even expect – I didn't even know Green Bay had an airport, but all right. Yeah, I think they go to like depending on the – like – I remember this year when they went to Brazil, they had to go to a different airport outside of Green Bay to go to Brazil because they couldn't take an international mm-hmm. flight from okay. Green Bay. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, that whatever. That was a storyline <laughs> earlier in the year. Um, okay, we're going to come back and talk about the game, talk about Sam, talk about a whole bunch of different stuff. Actually, one thing before we do that. So I mentioned earlier the Garrett Wilson comments and Robert Sala adjustments. Robert, please tell your players to stay off social media. Again, Garrett Wilson commenting on social media. That's not what I said. This was taken out of context. Whether he's right or wrong, I don't care. We've talked about this again. This is the same thing for four years. Tell your players to stay off social media. Why can't he do that? Uh, Listen, I I don't know. Um, You know, this is one of the the knocks of, quote, unquote, being a player's coach. And not being a hard nosed coach, you have to have a you have to draw a line, and you have to hold guys accountable. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, you know since he's been there, he's he's found a way to kind of make excuses for people uh, who are professionals um, instead of just holding guys accountable. And you know, I think he's more concerned about losing relationships with guys rather than being a coach. And you yeah. know, sometimes that come back to you know haunt you uh, later on. I, I think. Uh, you know, you, you speak about Rex Ryan, and I know everybody said, "Well, he is a player's coach," but play, but but Rex Ryan stood on business. Okay, mm-hmm. it, when it was time to play, it was time to play. But when it was time to work, it was time to work. Um, you know, obviously, you can't control other grown men. Uh, you just have to have a standard, and you have to have a, 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 a zero tolerance policy that if it happens, you have to be penalized for it. Okay, you have to hold everybody accountable the same way um, in, in order to get that. You know, you look at New England. How many how many unknown sources did you hear about when Tom Brady was there and Bill Belichick was there? None. So you have to have a standard as a coach. Um, there has to be a line of respect from the players. Um, I think that's the number one thing is just a line of respect uh, for unknown sources. Uh, but then you have to look at the guys. Some guys that want to go unknown sources and they want to be unknown sources, man, they're trying to find a second career after football. And they usually give the reporter a little more information trying to put their foot in the door uh, for the next uh, career in their, in their, um, in their life. But uh, I think it's number one, just he has to draw that line and he has to hold guys accountable. Yeah. uh, Something interesting actually to that effect was, I don't know if you saw this story back and forth, Baker Mayfield told, uh, he said to reporters like, well, uh, I think I relieved some of the stress for that was here from the previous quarterback because it's a little bit more fun with me around Tom Brady said about that. He's like, well, yeah, sometimes it's stressful to win. He's like, I didn't think I was, it wasn't stressful. We were, you know, business focused and we won championships can sometimes be serious. He's like, but when you win, it's fun. So I don't know. You didn't win anything. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, that's, that's the same thing. Like it, sometimes you have to be business focused to win. I mean, a lot of that has to do with the coach. Yeah. You know, it's the, like, culture. it's the culture, it's, it's, it's the players, it's how the players go about it. Let's be honest, man, your, your, your quarterback has to be, he has to be a commander. He you has know, to hold has everyone to, to higher he standards. Has to, he has to, especially if you're talking about a guy who comes from a winning culture. Like, there's a, there's a different way. And let's be honest, when, when Tom Brady won that Super Bowl, they didn't start off well that year. So I'm sure that he said, okay, enough, enough playing, 
it's time to handle business. I think the same thing. There were problems with him Rogers. and Bruce Arians. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. So that should like, give hey, Jets fans hope. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So like the difference is Bruce a- Arians was a proven winner. Robert Sala is a proven nothing. <laughs> you know? All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll talk about the game. Before we take a break, Bilal, you're wearing that hat from Mellon. Tell us about that. It's looking good. I'm not wearing it, and that's my mistake. I mean, it just sucks for me. What do you got going on? Show that hat off. Yeah, it's the Mellon. Mellon, Mellon, new sponsor. Appreciate it. Appreciate the partnership. Hopefully, we can continue to do something for my guy, Rami, and I. Um, it's a very comfortable hat, though. I love it. I love the material. And it's like a heavy leather right here. All right? It's, it's real heavy. Like, you got a mesh in the back. You look like, like you got a different one. Does that have like one of those ropes on the top? Or is that uh, can I see? Oh, that? Are you jealous? Did they I kind of one? am. Yeah, they sent me a couple yeah. styles, but it looks like they send you a couple styles too. So maybe we're gonna have to try all the different styles oh, yeah. out. Maybe they gotta keep, um, keep sending them. We'll, we'll, we'll keep wearing them. Exactly. Hey, I, keep sending. I, I looked it up, man. I'm like, oh yeah, this is a nice hat for sure for the price. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I looked up the variety. Um, they got a bunch of different stuff going on on the website, so uh, we definitely have to. Um, have to check it out, get more stuff. I'll have Jesse send me stuff because apparently that's how it works. Um, oh, yeah. I'm still waiting on those jerseys, but Jesse, that's Jesse's I'm, job. I'm going to so. put that on Jesse. <laughs> All right, perfect. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back after this and talk about Jets and Vikings. All right, coming back, we got Vikings and Jets in London. Sam Darnold revenge game, your former teammate. You were there his rookie season, Sam Darnold. Played against Aaron Rodgers. I was there too. You want to hear a great story from this? So I was sitting right behind. Uh, it was I was sitting pretty close. It was December. The Jets going into the game were four and ten. So you guys were not doing well. Uh, so tickets were pretty cheap. I was sitting right behind um, the the like the sideline at like the fifteen or twenty yard line, and I'm sitting right behind the sideline. And there's a guy like a middle aged dude. He kept like hollering at the cheerleaders they were wearing like the santa outfit you know yeah. you know what i'm talking about yeah. and he's hollering at them he's videoing them and i'm like this dude is such a creep and then it turns out after the game one of the cheerleaders comes running up to him it was his daughter and he was just videoing her the whole time i thought he was like uh, a creepy dude he was just like the, the girl's parent i was like oh, oh my god man. um but i was sitting there you know high as balls just trying to enjoy i went because aaron Rodgers is my favorite quarterback i went to go see aaron Rodgers. Sam Darnold put on a show. Do you remember um, that the tight end Herndon made that one-handed catch early in the game into the end zone? Do you, you know what I'm talking about? He just stuck out his paw and caught a you know, touchdown. I, you know, I, mean, I was I was in a dark time then. I that's I just came off that neck injury, so I wasn't really. Yeah. So him. were you there? I wasn't there. No, I was at home. So you're at. Got it. Yeah. yeah. But Sam Darnold, 25 or thir- 24, 35, 341 yards, three touchdowns. And then, mm. I don't know if you remember how this game ended. Again, you weren't there. Aaron Rodgers went off. Aaron Rodgers threw the ball 55 times. The Jets had a big lead in this game. Rodgers threw for 442 yards. He threw the ball 55 times. And he had two touchdowns. He won in overtime because going at the end of the game, when they were driving down the field, they called a couple of BS penalties in the end zone to give Rodgers extra chances. And then he eventually mm. scored and, tied it and then came down the field all right in front of me. He came down to tie it on the end zone right in front of me, and then wanted an overtime, the end zone right in front of me. Um, he almost threw a pick. I think it was um, Marcus May almost had a pick at one point. It was just – it was a wild game. Um, it was a fun game. It was one of the best games I've been at, and it was it was freezing cold outside, and it was just Aaron Rodgers going off. And that was what I went to see. Like, I didn't care. I wanted to see Sam be great, which he was in that game, and I wanted to see Rodgers be great because – you know, as a Rodgers fan, that's what I want to see. The final score is 40. I keep dropping my phone to look at the final score. I think it was 44-38 was the final score in overtime. So definitely a fun game to be at. Uh, but now Sam Darnold having an incredible year with the mm-hmm. Minnesota Vikings. He's the early MVP candidate. Did you see this from Sam? Did you see that this would be possible from Sam? Uh, listen, I always knew ta- uh, Sam had a, a talent hit on he, he always had a talented arm. He was making throws uh, just with – that were just out of position that you look back on film like, wow, I can't believe he was able to make that throw. I think the thing that hurt Sam early on in his development was the coaches. The, the coaches he had, the coaches he came in with, um, I don't think that they were coaches that were, were there to 
elevate his game from from that standpoint. Uh, obviously, he did have a veteran quarterback in Josh McCowan, but just from a system standpoint, uh, he had two offensive coordinators and you know back to back years. And as a young quarterback um, in your franchise, you don't want to see that in a guy like that. Um, you want to see a guy that's consistent in the system. And, you know, it, it, it was one of them things that was a disadvantage for Sam. You know, he finally found a home, just like uh, uh, Geno Smith has found a home. Um, I think he's fitting in perfect with the, with the uh, system. And it's going to be hard for J.J. McCarthy to take that star position away from Sam Donald. Oh, for sure. And I think with Gino, it's different because I see a different guy than I saw when he was in New York. I think he learned more. Sam looks like a lot of the same things. And I think at the same time, this is not a knock on Sam. I think some of the same flaws are there. Um, he's just found a better way to overcome them. Now, uh, with Sam and McCown, I just want to bring this up. Sorry, but you're not a huge Josh McCown fan, though. Right? Am I? Tell me. Are you? I like Josh. Oh, I thought you. somebody said something about Josh. No, not me. Like I, I like Josh. Oh, okay. And his son, I thought Natalie, I, his wife. And, yeah. I, I like oh, I'm just stirring stuff up for no reason. Yeah, he's huh? just starting to stir the pot. What's going on? Well, I remember someone saying something about how, like, oh, everyone talks about him as this, like, coach, you know, on the field. He wasn't that great. He wasn't that smart. I don't know. Oh, no, no. That wasn't me. I mean, you got to be a, you gotta be somewhat of a smart guy to hang around as long as he did. Yeah. No, that's true. I so mean, he wasn't a franchise quarterback, but you know, obviously, he knew the game. If he was, you did know, you see, able yeah. to pass around. Did you see that throw? So that's my bad. But did you see that throw to um to Justin Jefferson where the ball caught him? He didn't even catch the ball. It just fits between him and the corner. It just hits his chest before he even sees it's there, and he just grabs like that throw was crazy from Sam. Hey, listen, Sam. That's why they drafted him so high. He was able to make those throws, and again. Um, he didn't have the coaching. Again, he yeah. didn't have the talent. Like we didn't have, we didn't have the talent. Like yeah. if you're going to bring in a young quarterback, man, bring him in with talent. When Mark Sanchez came to the New York Jets, he had talent around him. Dude, let's not, you look let's at not that team. That. Robbie Anderson was the leading receiver. Receiver, Chris Herndon was the tight end. I don't even know who played running back that day. It was not you. It was um, Crowell. Were, Isaiah Crowell. No, it wasn't Crowell that day against the Packers. Let me find it. It was uh, McGuire. Is that Elijah McGuire? Elijah McGuire. Yeah. Oh I mean, he's like, he didn't have talent. 14 carries for 35 yards. Yeah. So That's a two and a half have, average. Yeah. So he didn't have talent around him, man. You And, you know, when you're talking about trying to uh, base your franchise around a, a quarterback, to me, that's like a if, – if you don't have the talent around and you're bringing him in, that's a setup. <laughs> that's just utilizing your early on pick. But if you come in a situation like Mar Sanchez, then you look like a franchise quarterback. I mean, with the guys that he was throwing to and handing off and the guys that were blocking up front on top of a great defense, like it's set up to be successful a young quarterback where you, you don't have to you don't have to uh, take on so much pressure. Uh, you can hand it off. Like Mar Sanchez wasn't throwing it 30, 40 times. He was throwing it 20, 25 times because he was able to turn around and hand the ball off to the Ladanian Thomason and Sean Green and, you know, all of these guys. So, uh, you know, Sam Donald just came into a tough situation. I always knew he was a good quarterback. Uh, he just needed to get in a good system. Just quickly, because this came out just now, Adam Schefter tweeted this. You know, Devontae Adams requested a trade um, from the Vegas Raiders. I don't even know. Adams ideally would like to play with a quarterback he knows. The Jets have former teammate Aaron Rodgers. The Saints have former teammate Derek Carr. Go get him, Jets. I wouldn't be opposed to it. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but hey, if he can't get off on a snap count, if he can't hold up on pass, bro, <laughs> then what, why are we bringing him over here? Because we still see guys on not on the same page. If it's not Xavier Gibson, you know, at the end of the game, who's not on the same page as Aaron Rodgers, it's a guy who we know is going to be on the same page as Aaron Rodgers. Even Garrett Wilson. Hasn't been on the same. What about page. Lazard? Yeah, he played with Lazard. Look, I just feel like. Yeah, but come on. There's a difference between Lazard, who's still making dumb penalties, and still, you know, he had a holding. He had the the finger gun, like late penalty for 15 yards. Like, there's so a difference between do? Alan Lazard so what do you do and, with and, and Devontae Adams. If you get, get Devontae Adams, what do you do with a Mike Williams? What do you do with a Lazard? How do you utilize? I think you Garrett put. Wilson? I think you put Wilson. 
in the slot and, and you put Williams and Adams on the outside and Lazard has to rotate in and has to find yeah. time. I, th- I like that lineup. Well, then go get him. I, I, I think they should go get him. Hey, I'm, I'm going to call I mean, right now. Heard. I'm going to put that on my notes. I th- and make sure I call yeah, him. I think, I mean, Rogers obviously wants him. Um, so we mentioned Justin Jefferson. What do you think that matchup looks like versus Sauce Gardner? I want to see Sauce Gardner travel. I want to see him. He did it a little bit on Sunday um, against uh, against um, Portland Sutton, but on the touchdown, he wasn't on Sutton. So yeah. I want to see what's happening. Like, I want to see them eliminate Justin Jefferson, say, Sauce, this is your job. And it's impossible to eliminate him. But maybe bait Sam into some bad throws that we've seen Sam make in the past. Maybe try and, you know, hey – I'm over here and then try and pick him off. Like how can the jets do that? How can they can be creative with their coverage against Justin Jefferson? I mean, in order to get creative in your coverage, you have to have a very successful pass rush Uh, because if if the quarterback is back there uh, with plenty of time to throw, then there's not much you can do from a scheme standpoint. The only way that you can get creative as a defensive coordinator, that if you know, I can just rush for or I can know if I send a blitz, we're going to get to the quarterback because we don't on the back end. It's going to be a long day for those guys. So I, I don't think that uh, they're comfortable yet with that because they have been struggling with the pass rush and getting to the quarterback uh, from a defensive line standpoint. So I, I think you just – I don't even think you see um, Gardner travel this week. I don't think you see Sauce traveling this week. Um, and that's just, that's just based on the scheme. Like, look at Rex Ryan. He was able to get creative because he had who? He had a great pass rush, and he had two lockdown corners. And Revis and, and Cromartie, yep. Yeah, so you were able to. he was able to get very creative to where he knew if anything came down to it, the, the outside was shut down. And I know, I but you, look, if, if the, the Jets have DJ Sauce and Michael Carter. Why can't they blitz more? Those are three as good corners there are in but the league. But if you blitz, you have to get to the quarterback. It, it doesn't okay, matter. Okay, but they didn't blitzing. blitz on Sunday. They didn't blitz. They, they went away from it. Against Tennessee, they blitzed. It worked in the second half. Against New England, they blitzed. They got to the quarterback. And then they stopped. They didn't do it against Bo Nix. I mean, hey, listen, it's uh, – who knows? It was a rainy day. And everybody's mind was foggy. I don't know. <laughs> I think I, I want to see the Jets blitz – because if they can get pressure on Sam, he is mistake prone. Like he, yeah, he that is. didn't. It's not. He's the same guy. He's just had but, time and space, and in the rhythm of that offense, it works. If you throw the rhythm of the offense off, and you tell all the corners to press up on the receivers and just throw the timing off and get a little bit of pressure, I think you could force some mistakes. I think so too. I mean, he's he's prone for it. But yep. again, are they? Or if they send it, they call it. Are they going to get there? Are they going to get there? Because if not... Or just confuse him enough. Even if you don't get there, confuse him enough that he throw, makes a mistake. Yeah. And Kevin O'Connor has a good system over there. He's smart. He's smart. He, and then Brian Flores on system. the other side. He had, listen, he has a good system. And I think you could put almost any quarterback, any starting quarterback in the National Football League right now to come over his system, they'll be successful. I think he has a really good system to where it's easy for progression for the quarterbacks. And it's just, it's just prone for... Anybody to come in there that has any kind of football sense to come in there and be successful. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Also, on the other side, Brian Flores. Do you play against Brian Flores when he was in Miami when he was coaching them? Um, I don't know what year it was. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't you know, I don't want to say. Well, he, I think he was, was he even with the Texans? Um, I'm not even sure, but I have to check on that. I think he was with the Texans. One year. Yeah. He well, coached them from 2019 to 21 in Miami. So I guess you were there in 19. Yeah, I was there. I was there in 19. I was there. All right. Well, he blitzes a lot and he could do the same thing. Put everyone up at the line and just try and throw off the timing because Aaron Rodgers with a swollen knee, right? Like he talked about from last week, like who knows if he's going to be able to move around and so if you're blitzing him, like, you throw their timing off, that could be a huge weapon for Minnesota. Yeah, that is. Um, but you you better get there too, though, because guess what? Rodgers will pick you apart if you did. send – if he'll – he's so smart. There was Rogers one play. Will, but, again, they have to get open. They I know. Have, there was one play, though, where he had – balls. 
there was a blitz off the edge against and Rodgers just threw it right over the guy who was blitzing to the to the tight end leaking out like that just basic if if you, if there's a guy coming from the side you know someone's going to be open on that side yeah yeah throw where they came from that's that's the whole thing in football you getting it Rami see I was so excited when I saw that. I was like, yo, hey, look, I get it. <laughs> I was like, they did it twice. He did it once with a with a tight end, once with a running back. I was like, oh, the blitz came from there. He threw it right where the blitzer came from. Yeah. It was great. Um, all right. So going into this game, Minnesota's minus two and a half in a neutral site. So I don't know what that means for I think there's gonna be a lot of points in this game. I feel like, you know, when you go on the defense has to travel. I don't know. You know What's what I mean? Over under. What's the over under? What for points? Yeah, I'm looking at that now actually because I know it's two and a half, but I should have looked this up sooner. Um, two and a half is the the line, but I think who do you think is the biggest X factor in this game? But while I look up this uh, the point total, the offensive line. Yeah, if, if, mean, the, if this is a, if this is a high blitz team, then the offensive line is going to be. The X factor to this game, being able to handle the pressure. The over's forty. The over under's forty and a half. I I would bet the over on that. Oh, it's gonna be more than forty points scored in this game. I think. I think so. No, I think so. Um. Yeah. The uh, you said it. The X factor is the offensive line for sure. I mean, that performance was disgusting, and they need to be better. Um. And Nathaniel Hackett, you could throw the X factor on him too. Be creative. You know, change things up a little bit. Because it looked like Denver knew exactly what to expect from the Jets, and they didn't have to adjust the entire game. And at the goal line, maybe bring in Braylon Allen, who's 500 pounds, and could just run it in as opposed to trying to run it from the one with Brees three times, and it didn't work. And then he ran a fade, a goal line fade to Solomon Thomas, the defensive lineman. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, sometimes it just seems so simple. Like, what are we seeing that they're not? Like, why are there people not seeing it? Why, can you text Brant Boyer and tell him to stop putting Xavier Gibson back there? We got to get him on the show and just say, enough Xavier Gibson. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was kind of, like, surprised last year with McCall Horman, a guy that specializes in that, that didn't test the field, didn't see the field. But yeah. now you went out and drafted Malachi Corley. You went out and drafted Isaiah Davis. Like, those are two guys who could be back there. Yeah. Hey, I'm um, not. I'm just a messenger. I, well, I want you to be the messenger to to Brant Boyer and see what he says back. I'm curious. I want to hear the answer from him because I like Brant. He I, they started giving him some love on camera too, and they did. They talked about him in the New England game. Like they started talking about your guy, and I was like, ah, that's my guy. <laughs> um, touchdown scores for the game. Who do you think scores for the Jets? Uh. Last game, they didn't score any touchdowns. Aaron Rodgers in his career, by the way. I'm, I'm going to take Braylon Allen. Did you know that there's – oh, that's a good one. Do you know that in Aaron Rodgers' career, there's only four games, I think, that he hasn't scored a touchdown, and two of them he didn't finish because of injury? Mm -hmm. So this was the third time that he started and completed the game without scoring a touchdown in his career. He's been around for 20 years. As well. That's uh, yeah. Yeah, it just tells you that – the Jets, even the Jets. Could be guys around you. Could be guys around you, man. I'm telling you. No, I know. Uh, I think Garrett Wilson will get one. I think the there's so much talk in the media this week about the connection with him and Rodgers and the lack of connection. I think Garrett's going to get one. I think Rodgers is going to say, hey, I need to get on the same page with him. And I think Rodgers has a chip on his shoulder. I think that. Rodgers is going to come out and play well. We know that when people doubt him, that's when he plays his best. The problem is his health. And yeah, the problem is just his, his health and the coaching. Those are the two things that I don't trust. So what's your score prediction for this game? Uh, I think I'm going to go 23-20. Jets. Jets? I, so you have the over. I agree with you on that. I'm going to go over also. I think the defense disappoints a little bit. I think the Jets lose 27-24. I think we're having a like just an awful discussion next Sunday and Monday. I think we're talking about them flying back and the coach and you know having to get ready for Monday night football, two and three facing the Bills. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. 
Um, and I don't want to predict that, but I, I don't see them beating the way the Vikings are going right now. I do think Rodgers can come out, chip on his shoulder, play well, put up 24 points, um, three touchdowns and a, and a field goal. But I think Sam and the offense is going to keep rolling. I think the Jets lose 27-24. Not what I want, but that's what I think is going to happen. Um, you got anything else for us, BP? No, I don't, man. Let's just go get this dub. Come on, guys. I hope so. I hope you're right. So until then, like, subscribe, share the podcast. Appreciate everyone for listening. See ya.